Good morning, everyone. I'm James Jeffrey, the chair of the Middle East program at the Wilson Institute. Today's Building a Better Lebanon initiative is organized in cooperation with knowledge partners that include the Atlantic Council, the Wilson Center, and the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. The project is sponsored by Beirut based Al Iftisad Wal Amal, which is the Arab region's leading business communications group. I would also like to welcome as our keynote speaker today, my longtime Foreign Service colleague and former U.S. Ambassador to Lebanon, David Hale. The World Bank's spring 2021 issue of Lebanon Economic Monitor warns that the crisis which the country is facing is, quote, likely to rank in the top 10, possibly the top three most severe crises globally since the mid-19th century. The report notes that Lebanon's gross national product fell from approximately 55 billion in 2018 to an estimated 33 billion in 2020. The dire economic situation will take decades to repair, with more than 55% of the population already in poverty, an unemployment rate of 40%. The workforce ratio of women is a disastrously low 23%. In this report, the co-authors explore the best ways out of this crisis. Building a Better Lebanon authors argue that any reform program should be simple, transparent, and most importantly, managed by credible government of reform. Advocating a combination of measures, they highlight immediate steps needed. The report builds on a series of workshops hosted by the Wilson Center and Atlantic Council with experts from and on Lebanon. Uh, let's look at the longer, uh, the larger geographic picture for a moment, please. The international system has interests that justify emergency economic assistance to Lebanon. First, to prevent creation of a failed state. Second, to keep Lebanon from the larger conflicts in the vicinity. Third, to support more than 2 million Palestinian and Syrian refugees. Fourth, to undergird Lebanon's magnificent experiment in cross-ethnic and cross-religious communal life. Finally, to avoid its subjugation to any outside power. There is currently a general international consensus linking, linking serious economic support for Lebanon with major reforms to attain effective governance, root out corruption, maintain capable nonpartisan armed forces, and undertake economic recovery and rebuilding. Longer term, the international community expects Lebanon to conduct elections in the spring of 2022. I will now turn the program over to Ambassador Gian Piero Masolo president of the Italian Institute for International Political Studies to provide an overview of the European perspective. Ambassador Masolo is a career diplomat, most recently served as coordinator of the Italian intelligence community and is also an adjunct professor, both at the School of Government of the LUISS University in Rome and at Sciences Po, Paris School of International Affairs. Ambassador Masolo, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, please let me say how pleased and honored I am to be uh, in this uh, broad conference about building better Lebanon and how much uh, we at ESP enjoyed cooperating with Wilson Center and the Atlantic Council. And I also want to greet Ambassador Hale and to thank him for having accepted to uh, be uh, our keynote speaker today and also thank you very much to our panelists by the way three of them Rand Gayad, Hook Tran and Meisa Kurma uh, are co-authors of the report so uh, thank you all very much. Um, of course Lebanon is a systemic crisis it is a crisis that has both uh, bilateral and uh, national consequences and national risks and uh, presents also major risks from the systemic point of view for the region itself. I would even dare to say for the international community uh, as such. Uh, it's actually a uh, multi-layer crisis. It's political crisis, economic, financial, humanitarian, cultural, and as, as usual, unfortunately, in the region, uh, many external spoilers and people that are interested to, uh, uh, to the instability of Lebanon are not helping from outside. And there is also a third layer here, a layer that involves uh, broader powers as the United States, as uh, Russia, 
I would say, China uh, with its uh, penetration uh, in the region, uh, which we need to contain. Uh, and I would say, of course, uh, European Union. European Union, uh, let's be frank, it's not exactly a master in handling regional political crises. Uh, there is still sort of a lack of identity for European Union on the international arena, and Lebanon is no exception for this, not necessarily the uh, uh, European member countries uh, represent a united front. But uh, my hope, uh, and it is not just a hope, it is also based on uh, an increase in what they see as an enhanced way of cooperating uh, among the European countries uh, together. Uh, maybe Lebanon can offer a platform, a basis in order to relaunch something like a meaningful uh, way for the European Union to intervene in his near neighborhood and to uh, take, uh, to assume uh, duties and responsibilities that are really up for Europe and for the individual member states to take, to take, to take upon themselves. <laughs> Um, actually, uh, as think tanks, uh, we are uh, in charge of providing um, perspectives and uh, try to act as catalyzers for governments. And this is actually what we are trying to do, uh, this be partnering with the Atlantic uh, Council and uh, with the Wilson Center. And I'm also offering here uh, our uh, joint endeavor in order to be able to take the opportunity of the incoming MED Dialogue Conference, which uh, we are organizing together with the Italian, co Italian uh, government for early December, in order to offer an idea and platform to engage the participation of important leaders, experts, and trying to keep high our commitments. And for uh, to do this, uh, I am convinced that the recommendations that are coming out from our joint report can serve as a good basis in order for our work to progress. Thank you once again to all of you. Please, I am now switched to Ambassador Hale for the for his keynote remarks. Please. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, and it's great to see uh, so many friends uh, that have joined us and particular thanks to Jim Jeffrey and Marissa Horma from the Wilson Center and Hadley, I look forward to our conversation. Um, just to start with one point, I, I'm still uh, an employee of the State Department and uh, I'm on detail at the Wilson Center. So I do wanna say that my comments today are not uh, on behalf of the US government or the State Department, but just based on my own uh, observations. Uh, I've been in and out of Lebanon since 1988 and have lived there for a total of eight years, spread over that period of time. Uh, it's been a big part of my life. Uh, most recently I was there just as Ramadan began. And I have to say, I've not seen uh, in all these years, uh, the level of despair uh, since the end of the tragic civil war, in fact. I met with many Lebanese leaders uh, across the board uh, to discuss the prolonged political gridlock and the deteriorating economic conditions. Uh, I have to say, few shared uh, the sense of urgency uh, that they should have. Um, I called for greater flexibility by those leaders to overcome the cabinet impasse that is impeding economic reform. And unfortunately, I've not seen such flexibility in the last two months or so, uh, nor did I after I visited in August 2020 during in the wake of the uh, port explosion, uh, nor after December 2019 when I visited as the current state of paralysis set in. Um, Lebanon is precarious even at the best of times. Its structure of governance makes it hard to get things done by design uh, so that no community feels dominated. Uh, historically, governments do very little, uh, while a sort of economic free-for-all uh, produces winners and losers. Um, I think the protests of the past decade have had a lot to do with a public sense that uh, there are way too many winners and far too few losers, uh, and that those winning uh, do so by virtue of uh, graft and corruption uh, and access to public funds. Um, the Lebanese people are suffering the consequences of their failure to, the leader's failure to meet uh, their responsibility uh, to put the country's interests first. Uh, people have lost their life savings, access to basic health care, 
and even the ability to feed their families. Uh, the housing crisis arising from the port explosion remains acute. Uh, Lebanese popular demands are also well known. Uh, transparency, accountability, and end to the endemic corruption and mismanagement. And meeting these demands will put Lebanon at least a little bit down the road to fulfilling its incredible potential. And the report being presented today provides a wealth of expertise and proposals on how to do so. Uh, but little will happen without the necessary political will. Uh, the U.S. and others have long called for Lebanon's leaders to show sufficient flexibility and form a government that's willing and capable of reversing the collapse underway. Uh, the time to build a government, not block it, is upon us, and the time for comprehensive reform is now. Uh, we in America are ready to help, but can't without a Lebanese partner. One bright spot is the possibility that Lebanon may have offshore gas. During my visit, there was some hope that we could move forward with U.S.-facilitated talks with Israel on this matter under a U.N. umbrella. I hope that remains the case and Lebanon's leaders will refrain from allowing their own competition uh, to block progress that could benefit people on both sides of the border. Which brings me to Hezbollah. Lebanon will never regain its strength or achieve true sovereignty uh, so long as one faction can accumulate dangerous weapons and undertake smuggling and other illicit and corrupt activities. Uh, no state can live up to that name of being a state so long as one faction answering only to a foreign capital can make life and death decisions for all the state's citizens. Uh, yet that is the situation in Lebanon today. In contrast to Iranian arming of a faction of a militia, the U.S. has been helping to boost the capabilities of the Lebanese army uh, for years, benefiting all Lebanese. Lebanon's true friends around help, uh, should help strengthen the state and not one faction. I'm asked often about the link between Lebanon and the talks in Vienna on re restoring compliance with JCPOA. Um, those talks are focused on JCPOA, not on the region. But the truth is, if we want a vibrant and peaceful Lebanon, we will have to address all elements of Iran's destabilizing behavior in the region, including in Lebanon. We will defend our interests and support our friends in Lebanon. Uh, and I believe that view is shared in Washington on a bipartisan basis. American policy in this regard is firm. So there is no reason for anyone in Lebanon to adopt a wait and see attitude. America's core interests do not shift year to year or administration to administration. There has been strong bipartisan support for our approach to Lebanon. But to succeed, Lebanese leaders have to do their part to undertake necessary reforms to salvage the socioeconomic uh, situation and access the international financial resources that help, can help restore Lebanese faith in their future. Uh, once they make that decision, once they show that political will, I think the report and the discussion we have today will help inform uh, the tangible steps needed in order to fulfill uh, those wishes. Thank you very much. I'm, I look forward to the discussion and, and hearing more from the experts. Over. Hadley, you're on mute. Excellent. Hope everyone can hear me now. Um, thank you so much, Ambassador Hale. Once again, I'm Hadley Gamble. I'm CNBC's senior international correspondent and anchor in the region. And it's uh, a thrill as always to be talking about a subject that's very close to my heart. And I know close to the hearts of all of you involved in this incredible report uh, for building a better Lebanon. Hopefully we um, can, frankly, sustain the challenges of today and tomorrow. Ambassador Hale, thank you so much for those remarks. I wanna just get right into it um, with you at this point. Um, you were just discussing um, America's interests, obviously uh, in Lebanon and in the region more broadly. And obviously you are not speaking directly for the government. I wanna reiterate that as well. But when you think about this within the context of your knowledge of this part of the world, what leverage do you believe that the United States actually has today with regards to Iran and via Iran, Hezbollah, uh, when it comes to influencing what happens in Lebanon, if the Biden administration is, as is in recording in progress, intent on getting a deal with regards to a new JCPOA, what's the leverage that the United States has at this point? Well, we'll see once a deal is is made what the ingredients are that we have to work with. But um, there are a whole because there's a sense that we're giving it all away if we open yeah. up the tent, if you will. But with central bank uh, with allowing Iran once again to be part of the international financial system. 
Well, there are a stack of other sanctions in place uh, that are uh, there because of Iran's behavior in the region and because of their human rights violations, uh, because of their terrorist activity. Um, I don't have the which sanctions apply to which cases, but uh, Iran will continue to be constrained by those sanctions until uh, they address those concerns of ours. Um, I think we also need to show unity of uh, purpose and uh, show that there's an alliance in the region of those who reject uh, Iranians' behavior uh, and to stand together uh, and call out uh, Iran's actions when they occur. Um, so the reputational issue as well, I think is important. Uh, so those will be the two main tools that we have. Um, and I think it's very important that we continue to speak out and to make sure that no one forgets uh, what Hezbollah and other proxies of Iran are doing. Who do you consider to be the real main partners of the United States in this other than the EU? Because at this point, when I speak to leaders specifically in the Gulf countries, and I'm talking about the UAE, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, uh, they have a very, very hands-off approach to what happens in Lebanon. They seem to have given it up as a loss in that sense. Well, um, it is true that uh, some of the senior uh, Gulf officials have been very frustrated, uh, as we all have been, by this situation that I described in Ambassador Masolo. Um, but I noticed today uh, that the Saudi foreign minister joined uh, the French foreign minister and Secretary Blinken in a meeting on Lebanon, or at least partially on Lebanon, and there was a statement on Lebanon. Uh, so there may be a, a, a renewed recognition that however frustrating the situation may be in Lebanon, all of us have interests there. And we know from the historical perspective if you look back over time at past crises, uh, neglect of Lebanon will not make Lebanon better. Um, so we need to find ways uh, without throwing away our resources uh, to make sure that Lebanon is put on a more stable set, uh, footing. <clears throat> in terms of that stable footing, what's the greatest danger there in your view? Well, there's an immediate uh, catastrophe upon us, which is the financial situation, the, the Ponzi scheme that essentially the banks and uh, the government and leading uh, business entities have been involved and has gone on for decades, but it's reached a point now where a collapse is imminent. And I think the, the report addresses that, has some ideas. The most urgent thing to do is to stabilize the financial picture um, and, then, and then embark on the other reforms that are needed. But, you know, economics and finance go hand in hand with politics and security. And so, again, we have to make sure that there is a government that not only has the political will, but the means to accomplish these reforms. Um, and secondly, that we continue to provide our assistance to the legitimate institution that is uh, meant to defend Lebanon and secure Lebanon, and that's the army, uh, in contrast to Iran's strategy. Ambassador, you talked about a Ponzi scheme. What does it, or what is it meant to say to people in Lebanon when U.S. officials, yourself included, continue to meet with the central bank governor, Riyad Salemi, who was actually under investigation in Switzerland and elsewhere um, for activities uh, that supposedly have been ripping off the Lebanese people. A lot of Lebanese don't consider him to be someone who is uh, someone worth actually speaking to. They consider him part of the problem. You refer to it as a Ponzi scheme. Should American officials still be meeting with him? Well, he's, he's the governor of the central bank and he's uh, crucial for uh, finding a way forward. Um, I would do you not believe he was part of the problem in terms of that Ponzi scheme? I would, I would not blame any one individual. I've not seen any evidence Obviously, if there's investigations underway, they will, they will uncover what there is, if anything, to uncover. I'm not here to defend or uh, otherwise, do otherwise uh, of an individual. But we meet with everybody in Lebanon except terrorists. Uh, it is a country where if you cut yourself off as a, a diplomat, foreign government, from uh, any uh, of the elements that have say-so in Lebanon, you're doing yourself a disservice. So we'll continue to talk to, to him and to others uh, to try to make sure that the right things are done to put Lebanon back on a path towards stability. I understand what you're saying, but isn't that a form of financial terrorism to destroy a country? Uh, the, de the decisions were made by governments, uh, and uh, they were they were operating based on uh, whatever inputs they felt were important at the moment. Uh, you know, I wrote I remember vividly. I wrote a telegram in 1992. In my I was a political economic officer in Beirut, where I I, I wrote extensively on this problem. And I said, this is going to collapse any moment. Of course, that was 1992, and here we are. It continued for quite a while. There are a lot of people who've been involved over time and bear some responsibility for this situation. That's why it's so acute, as it is, it is, it has taken so, so long, it has dug so deeply into, uh, into the institutions. 
we think about the, the political pressure or the political will um, that needs to be uh, considered in order for anything to move forward in Lebanon today. Apparently, the IMF uh, today informed the caretaker finance minister that um, they might consider allocating as much as $900 million to Lebanon come August. Uh, that was just to boost the foreign currency reserves of the central bank. The problem, of course, for Lebanese folks, uh, much more immediate. And of course, all of this against the backdrop of what we've seen coming out of this um, coronavirus pandemic globally. When you think about this with regards to the U.S. government specifically, what can the U.S. government or what can the Lebanese people hope for from the U.S. government specifically in terms of trying to get back on their feet, at least in the short term? Because we can talk about building a better Lebanon as much as we want. The door has to be open, doesn't it? It does, but the key to opening the door is in the hands of Lebanese leaders. Uh, they have to demonstrate to us that they have the will and the capacity to take the reforms needed so that any international financing will not be wasted as it has been in the past. Um, so it, there's not going to be any international bailout. Um, there will be substantial assistance for uh, a reform program that's going to be painful. And uh, I hope today there's some talk about that because the Lebanese people have had enough. And uh, particularly you know, people on the lower end of the, of the economic spectrum, uh, lower income people just are living hand to mouth. And so there has to be found a way to not just impose the tough reforms, but make sure that people can survive. Uh, so if we, see, if we see strategies from the Lebanese that demonstrate that, and again, I'm not speaking for the government anymore, but I was up till two months ago, and our lines have always been, you will see generosity from the international institutions, financial institutions where the U.S. has a large vote. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, we'll also see what we can do independently, uh, particularly on the humanitarian front, to help soften uh, you know, the, what will inevitably be some of the pain from the reform. When I would speak to U.S. officials over the last 48 years, there just wasn't that much appetite, frankly, for Lebanon. And when I would speak to Trump officials, for example, they would tell me if the top 10 things are on the list, Lebanon is 12, 14, or 15 on down. What do you think that the Lebanese can at least count on from the U.S. in the short term? You talked about support of the Lebanese army, but at the same point right now, they're not able to feed their people. They're not able to pay their people. What can we expect in the short term, do you think, from the U.S. government, even as just a stopgap measure? Yeah, it's true that Lebanon doesn't always rise to the high priority. But again, I, I've always made the point that uh, don't wait for the crises uh, because then you're dealing with an even worse situation. So we need to tend this situation at all times. Um, and in addition to whatever direct bilateral assistance we provide, which is in the hundreds of millions of dollars annually, um, we, we are an advocate for Lebanon with others. And so, for example, uh, we give substantial assistance to the Lebanese army, but we can't pay their salaries. Uh, well, others can. And so we've talked to the EU. Uh, Bastrom Solo can address that. We've talked to the government of France uh, about it. And these are the discussions that Secretary Blinken has been having. Um, it came up in the bilateral meeting uh, with, with the French foreign minister. Uh, it came up at the G7 uh, meeting with the French. Uh, so it does, it is discussed. But I think people should look to the United States as being able to, um, to sort of amplify our own assistance by encouraging others to be generous. Again, on condition that the reforms are really uh, and truly being made, not just a bailout. How do you respond to those who say that the Lebanese people are being held hostage by their own ineffectual and corrupt political leaders, that there is no way around it? Well, uh, there has to be found a way around it. I mean, it's certainly true that uh, the people are suffering from the uh, behavior of their leaders, uh, and I, I will not uh, defend that at all. I criticize it every time I have a chance to speak about Lebanon. Uh, but we can't just abandon that, you know, Lebanese to that situation. Um, but, but then, again, we've got to put the pressure on Lebanese leaders to make the right decisions. We can't do that for them. They can't wait for outsiders to come and fix uh, the political problems, uh, which has been the pattern in the past. And so they uh, inevitably expect that at some point others will come in. I do not see that uh, on the horizon. Uh, they're going to have to resolve the political differences sufficiently to get the reforms underway. <clears throat> Ambassador, there's an argument to be made or that some have been making that essentially with years of the maximum pressure campaign on Iran and then with the uh, simultaneous uh, destruction of the Lebanese economy, that opened the door for, frankly, Hezbollah uh, to become uh, you know, a full steam ahead in terms of money laundering. At this point, um, the black market for dollars is such that they're being able to, they're able to fund themselves. 
Um, do you believe that within that context, U.S. maximum pressure was a failure? Because essentially, no. no. I, 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 I would phrase it. I'd phrase the whole issue slightly differently, if I may, Hadley. Uh, Hezbollah has been doing that for decades. They're getting better and better at it, but they have been. Uh, well, they're certainly using... much better at it with a failed state in terms of the economy. It, that uh, they they uh, do not suffer as much as the others do, but they have vast sources of income. Uh, they get money from uh, their followers around the world. They do illicit activities, as you said, inside Lebanon, and they get a huge cash infusion from the Iranians, which never stopped. So they, they had the resources they needed before JCPOA. They had the resources they needed during JCPOA. They had the resources they needed during maximum pressure. And they will have resources after, if there is a JCPOA, uh, you know, is, is, uh, returns to compliance. But the point I'm making is we should not accept that. Uh, but we should be clear that uh, it is an incredibly resilient organization. So we need smart strategies in order to deal with it. Um, and I don't think that uh, we have yet frankly found that. Uh, we need to think harder about what, what we're going to do. Now, maximum pressure might have worked if we had, uh, you know, if more time had been allowed for it. We don't know. More how JCPOA might have worked if we'd allowed more time for that. We don't know. These are all imponderables. All I know is I see a steady trajectory, regardless of the uh, regional environment, where his blood just gets stronger and stronger, and we've got to stop that. Ambassador, thank you so much for your remarks. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you again. I want to get now to the actual report and the author of that report, Building a Better Lebanon. Um, um, Ron Gaida is the adjunct professor from Harvard University. Um, Marissa Kerma, of course, director of Middle East program at the Wilson Center. Hung Chan is a non-resident senior fellow for the Atlantic Council and um, as a commentator as well on this report, Mohsen Khan, he's non-resident senior fellow for the Atlantic Council. He's also the former director for the Middle East and Central Asia, the IMF. It's wonderful to have you all join us and thank you again so much for your work on this report. I do uh, want to kick it off with Ron, however, and just to get to, to the initial can question, really. I mean, we, we kind of all know where we how we got here, but if you'd like to just give us a, a brief overview of, of where we are at this moment and how potentially we could move forward in the coming days. As uh, the ambassadors mentioned, we have elections supposedly coming up in the spring of 2022. Um, there seems to be some movement, at least uh, within government at this point. Ron, take it away. Thank you, Hadley. I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you. And I want to thank the uh, ambassadors for the time they've put into this. Look, I think at this point, uh, everybody has a very good understanding of the reasons why Lebanon ended up here in the first place. This is obviously a crisis that has been in the making for many, many years. Uh, I tend to disagree a little bit with Ambassador Hale. I think Riyad Salemi is a key uh, part of this crisis. Unfortunately, we're now uh, no longer in an economic uh, crisis. It's, it's, it has turned into a humanitarian crisis. You've got mass poverty, you've got mass unemployment, and you've got a new wave of, the, of immigration by the very same people that the country needs today to rebuild the, uh, rebuild the economy. So, I mean, the, the, the good news, the good news is in Lebanon and in the diaspora, you've got an enormous amount of human capital. And we've been seeing a lot of different initiatives over the, uh, over the past year, although views continue to differ on what should be done to address the crisis. So just very briefly, you've got a, you've got a camp now that is calling for a new economic model focused primarily on agriculture. On the other hand, you've got another camp calling for a comprehensive full-fledged structural and fiscal adjustment program, of course, with the, uh, under the umbrella of the IMF, with a very long list of front-loaded reforms. And, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, you'd want to see all these reforms happening at the same time. But experience from other countries, and especially fragile states, states like Lebanon with very weak cohesiveness, very weak institutions, have actually shown that it's very difficult to actually adhere and to stick to a program that is very intense like this. I mean, I myself, and I know that my colleagues here on the panel have all worked on IMF programs and have all seen programs that went uh, off track because it was very demanding. So the bottom line, it's not really a shortage of economic ideas. It's mainly what, what is lacking today is a pragmatic and uh, reliable roadmap for implementation, for implementing all these ideas in a way that you don't really threaten the stability in the country. You've got a very fragile state. And um, 
my three very uh, brief points on here and uh, I, Basically, I mean, let me make it clear what needs to be done, and then we, we can talk more about the specific. But the first, very first step here is we need a government. There is no way we can move forward without a government, and not just any government, just for the sake of forming a government. We need a credible government of reform, a government that owns what it says it wants to do. Uh, we need a government that is very well represented by the private sector. Uh, these are basically the, uh, the people who will be creating the jobs. And you cannot really bypass the government. We've seen a couple of initiatives talking about reform, uh, plans directly with the private sector. Unfortunately, if we want to go to the international community, IMF, World Bank and others, their bylaws would not allow us to bypass the government. So that's the, the first key point. The second most important point, uh, and that has to do basically with the multilateral corporations and specifically here I'm referring to the IMF. Uh, look, I mean, there is no doubt that the IMF's blessing is going to be extremely important. The IMF is going to be key in any future program for Lebanon. But in my view, that this narrative today, that a comprehensive IMF program with so many different reforms is actually a bit premature. It's going to be very difficult to negotiate. And in fact, IMF financial resources aren't really very important. What is important is the financial resources that's going to come from donor countries, from bilateral uh, uh, countries, from, from the diaspora. So before we even talk about an IMF program, what Lebanon needs to do is to, first of all, re-engage with the international community. You cannot cut yourself off the world, as Ambassador Hale said. You cannot cut yourself off the, the world of the Gulf region of all your friends and then go ask for an IMF program. And that gets me to my last point, and I'll make it very brief. What type of program we need to do, to, uh, we need to basically uh, think about today. So given what, what we all discussed, given the fragility of the state institution, given weak cohesiveness, a very long history of sectarian conflicts, polit political instability in Lebanon, I think any program that is radical, that is dramatic, is not, not, is not only going to be counterproductive, but may actually end up undermining the entire reform process. So Lebanon really needs, sadly, a very simple, transparent program focused in the immediate term on what I call the low-hanging fruit. And these are basically initiatives that would deliver just very quick, tangible, and wide-ranging benefits for everybody in the economy. And this will help, you know, gradually build confidence so that all stakeholders in the economy can actually buy into a longer term process of reform. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here and turn back to you and we'll talk more about it later. Rand, before I let you go on that one, I just want to follow up on the one on the one key point there. You mentioned, of course, obviously, uh, the business owners, the, the community of folks who would do all of the employing that Lebanon really, really needs. And you also missed the mentioned the Lebanese diaspora. I spend a great deal of time speaking to the Lebanese diaspora across a, 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 a wide range of means, if you will, um, from the, the multi-multi-billionaires uh, to, to just the folks eking out a living now here in the UAE, for example, because they've been forced to move. When you think about that a bit more broadly, how do you gain the confidence of those folks with such a corrupt uh, state at this point? How is that possible? Not just to gain the trust, again, of the Lebanese diaspora, to put their money, to put their time, and to start businesses in Lebanon, but also, of course, governments, because they don't trust the people that they're talking to. Well, first of all, you need, again, you need to give them the opportunity to decide on the future of the country. So that's why when I go back to the first point, which is we need a government, these people need to have a seat on the table. People from the diaspora, people from, uh, from, from Lebanon, women is the most underrepresented asset, underestimated asset in Lebanon. So these need to have a say on any future program. And that's the, the first key point. The second key point is, um, I mean, look, uh, there is plenty of things that you can do to regain confidence, but the process is going to take time. Reforms take a lot of time to, to lead uh, for positive results. I mean, the first, I, th I think the first very uh, important thing to do so that you can give the, the sense that you're actually serious about reforms is maybe start with the World Bank. The World Bank has an asset recovery program. This is something that could perhaps give a good sense of uh, commitment. Obviously today, as you know, Hadley, political leaders, they have no appetite for reform. I mean, 
anything that would give some hope, an asset recovery program with the World Bank, a, uh, a, any, anything on corruption, a committee that is serious about corruption, uh, public, uh, publicizing uh, uh, public officials' uh, assets, all these are you know, small steps to a much longer process of reform, and they will help build confidence, but gradually. You cannot, you cannot, the point is you cannot really shock the patient to prosperity in one day. Otherwise, the patient is going to die. You, you, you got to do it step by step, and it's going to take a lot of years, as Ambassador Jeffrey said at the, at the start of this. I want to bring in Hung Tran on this as well. Um, when you think about this a little bit more broadly, just even the first step of this of building Lebanon, building a better Lebanon, we're talking about stopping that bleeding. And Rand was just saying you can't do it. You can't shock the patient while they're on the operating table. Um, walk us through the minimum required at this point, in your view, uh, to get Lebanon at least stable um, in the short term? Well, from the point of view of the financial uh, sector and the collapse of the banking system, uh, several things are needed right away. Number one, a serious audit of the central bank and the banking sector in Lebanon to really ascertain the magnitude of the losses in US dollar denominated loans and bank deposits. Lebanon has the highest ratio of US dollar denominated uh, claims in terms of loans and deposits, almost five times the GDP of the country, the highest in the world. And since the US dollar inflow has been cut significantly over the past two years, there's no way for Lebanon to continue with that model to import US dollar to fund a necessary import and to sustain and service such a huge amount of US dollar denominated um, bank loans and deposits. So number one, serious audit. Number two, to realize that the losses to the uh, banking system, both the central bank and the banking system, commercial banks, is significant and tremendous. Uh, according to the Lebanese government owns plan for uh, uh, rescue and reconstruction, more than 60 billion US dollar losses are sustained by the central bank of uh, Lebanon, including all the losses hidden by financial engineering uh, maneuvers and transactions that the central bank has been put on, and more than $80 billion of losses for the commercial banks. The talk now is to really build in or to get the shareholders and the creditors and the large depositors of the banks to absorb the loss. Yes, that has to be done. But even if you build in all the shareholders and most of the uh, wealth of the large depositors, it may not be sufficient to absorb the scale of losses that I have indicated and to provide fresh capital to recapitalize the banking system to set the, the basis for a recovery for the Lebanese economy. And number three, therefore, it is clear that Lebanese will need foreign assistance, fresh capital from outside the country, either from friendly countries or from the diaspora to recapitalize the banking system. And therefore, they really need to demonstrate that they are willing, happy, and able to undertake the least, the, the minimum um, reform in the banking system to get that support. And my idea in the report is to suggest the formation of a Lebanese financial rehabilitation fund, partnered after the Greek Hellenics a financial stability fund, supported by friendly countries, so that it can start the process. And in this, the Lebanese government and Le Lebanese public should be committed to contribute to this fund, either by selling their state or assets or selling some of their gold. Um, to do anything that you've just discussed, is it possible to do any of that with Riyad Salemi still running the central bank and with Salim Sphir now re-elected to be the chairman of the Association of the Banks of Lebanon? Well, uh, again... With these um, two guys running the show, is it possible uh, to do any of the things you're talking yes. about? My, my, my argument is not depending on any personalities. My argument is say that the more you delay, the more you avoid doing this necessary minimum reform, the worse the situation will become and the worse you yourself will find yourself in. So by sheer interest and self-survival, even for those uh, people, they will have to, at some point, accept that they need to do something to get out of this hole. Otherwise, they keep digging and the hole will get deeper, regardless of personalities. Marissa, come in on that one, especially talking about um, the idea that we've got to stem the bleeding in the short term, um, not just for uh, the millions of refugees, but we also are talking about um, half the over half the population, which is, of course, women. Yeah, yes. I mean, yeah, uh, go ahead, Marissa. 
Yeah, um, yeah, Je uh, Ambassador Jeffrey mentioned that the female labor participation rate has decreased. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Uh, yeah, yes, the, the, the women factor is huge. That's where the untapped potential is. Uh, female labor participation stands at 23% and it's on the decline, unfortunately. Um, and with, with, with that factor in particular, there, there, there are interventions that can be done through development um, uh, donors and uh, development programs that are already working in Lebanon through different UN agencies and other international NGOs. Uh, so increasing capacity of women, uh, offering mentor, mentoring programs, those are all excellent inter interventions. They should be promoted and strengthened further. But what women are lacking is access to finance. Because even though um, Lebanon, Lebanese women um, uh, that uh, own 10% of businesses, and that's a little bit higher than the regional average, with, with the exception of a few GCC countries, it is still very low given the potential that we have um, and the, um, uh, the high education. They're highly educated women. Uh, and so um, access to finance is key. I would also dare ask international aid agencies to ensure that anytime they support a given program, a given development program, that they ensure that that NGO supports women, that they employ women as an equal footing uh, to men, and that they also ensure that at least 50% of their beneficiaries are women. It might be controversial, but that's sometimes the only way you can ensure that women are, um, are being um, included. I think what we've seen uh, with, with the pandemic uh, um, effects on the workplace, um, with work basically being remote for everybody, that will obviously help a lot of women enter the workforce, but also start their businesses online. Uh, so those uh, more efforts should pro probably go into um, supporting women who want to start their businesses, particularly online, and that's a huge um, area of uh, a huge opportunity for um, Lebanese youth as well moving forward. I just want to mention to everybody, depending on where you may be joining us from, at any time during this webcast, you can submit your questions. Either you can submit them via Twitter at Wilson Center MEP or by email MEP at WilsonCenter.org. And we're going to obviously have the question and answer in just a little while from now. But I want to bring Mohsen Khan in now just to give us his reaction to this report as a whole um, and in terms of what we can at least expect in the coming months as uh, the political forces continue to pressure Lebanon. Mohsen. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, let me start off by saying that um, uh, this report is extremely timely. Uh, but let me just uh, go step back a minute and say the Lebanese crisis um, that uh, is not is not a surprise that it's a crisis. I think Ambassador Hale mentioned that in 1992, um, it, it it was the crisis then as well. The fact of the matter is, why has it taken so long to actually erupt into, into this um, um, situation that we face now? Um, I don't, I, I've been working on um, uh, Middle East countries for a long time and the IMF too. Um, and quite honestly, this is the most serious crisis I've, uh, in my experience, that I've ever seen, right, as crisis it is in, in Lebanon. So there are two key um, uh, things that are needed to solve this crisis. When I come to the, the, the economic policies uh, uh, shortly, one is, of course, uh, uh, it's evident to everyone uh, that the precondition is political consensus, a government that is uh, politically uh, in agreement that this, this is a, these are the issues and these are the actions they must take. Barring that, nothing's going to happen. Um, and I think that the second big uh, lift here is that, that you need uh, a tremendous amount of financing. Uh, I mean, I think the issue really is we can talk about billions here, billions there, etc., coming from donor countries. And I understand from the IMF, from the World Bank, etc. But if you look at at Hong France, just the bank restructuring and bank rehabilitation uh, needs, the amounts are huge. They're, you know, of an order of magnitude of, of uh, if, you, if you can raise 10 billion, you need 50 billion. Uh, 
that, where is that going to come from? And I, I see the prospects of that very limited. Now, I think that, that um, bank rehabilitation, and the reason for that is, of course, very evident. And it's been evident for a long time. Um, you know, one way to characterize it is that in Lebanon is a big bank with a small country attached to it. The banking system is five times the size of, well, more, over five times the size of, of GDP of Lebanon. So if anything goes wrong in the banking system, and a Ponzi scheme was going on for so long, um, you know, you, the, the country is destroyed. And I think that may, that point, the first thing I would mention is that, that Hong Tran makes a very good case for why this is needed for to do uh, why the uh, bank rehabilitation is, is essential. Um, they'll have, there will be costs of doing that. And the costs will be borne by a lot of people. I don't think you can just simply say that the costs will only be borne by the wealthy. That's not going to happen. Everyone is going to share in those costs. Even the people who have suffered the most would be asked to suffer some more in there. Now, in the program that that uh, Rand has outlined, I think I, I agree in large part with the, the, the policies that he's suggesting, that you have to do it in stages. You have to do the, the financial uh, rehabilitation first. Of course you do. Then you move on to sort of other things like uh, 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 reforms of various kinds, changing the system, reforming the, the electricity company, fixing the subsidy problem. Uh, all, all these are absolutely essential. I think that I, I see the case that he's making, that the report is making that, you know, you can't impose fiscal austerity um, on, the, on uh, the Lebanese people. I agree with that. But the point is that austerity will come. Uh, it doesn't have to be fiscal. Let me just put it another way. This monetary and financial austerity that people in Lebanon are going through now, and they will, this will continue. So essentially, reduction in, in, in the classic thing is you try, if you, demand is running over uh, your productive potential, you have to bring demand down or you have, and you have to raise productive potential. So here I come to what, um, Marissa is saying uh, part in this. I thought this is essentially, the, if I may summarize, what she is saying is that you have to transform the Lebanese economy with a new economic model. And that new economic model is not the banking system you, uh, any longer, because that's all Lebanon has had. The new economic model has to emphasize other sectors of the economy, whether it's agriculture or manufacturing, um, certainly technology. Uh, these are the uh, sectors that Lebanon, uh, future Lebanon must have. And I think that, that that fits in nicely. And if I can just uh, have you just briefly summarize, you go, you're going, you've, you've got a crisis, you've got a Ponzi scheme that's come to an end, okay? Um, all Ponzi schemes come to an end and they end badly. Uh, but you've got a Ponzi scheme, it's come to an end. We're facing a, a disastrous situation in Lebanon. What are the steps you must take to fix it? First, you go off, uh, try and sort out the banks, which has been the trigger for this. Sort out the banks. You then come into the structural reforms, whether it's fiscal reforms, revenue reforms, subsidy reforms, and so on and so forth. And finally, you come to building a new economic model, in a sense, making Lebanon quite different from what it is, has been for the last 20, 30, or even longer years. Rand, I want you to pop in on this one because essentially what we're saying at this point is, I mean, if you look at Lebanon as a whole, I, I forget if it was Ambassador Jeffrey who said this a bit earlier, he called it a magnificent experiment in cross-communal life. Um, others would look at Lebanon and say they were just the grasshoppers that sang all summer. 
Um, and, and now that's all come home to roost. But in terms of creating that new economic model, um, the, the things that have to take place in order to get there, some of the things listed in the report, obviously reducing the public sector wage bill, enhancing tax uh, progressivity, reforming obviously the electricity sector and restructuring other state owned enterprises. That was something that in an interview I did less than two years ago with Saad Hariri when he uh, finally decided to say that we were in an economic crisis in Lebanon, though he refused to bring in the IMF. This was something he was very much focused on, he said, which was so tempting uh, to take a lot of those state owned enterprises private. Where do we go from here in that sense, Rand? Look, I mean, the, the most important thing, let me let, let me take just a quick step back because we, we keep hearing about this narrative that the IMF is going to be the silver, uh, silver bullet. I, I, let, let me be clear. I mean, the IMF, and I will reiterate what I said earlier, the IMF is going to be extremely important. Uh, as Hong has mentioned in his in his analysis, uh, the IMF's technical assistant, particularly now in the short term, is going to be extremely helpful to rebuild the institutions and to start the process of a longer term reform. But any program, any uh, any plan, any civilization plan needs to be uh, very well tailored to the Lebanese situation. It needs to take into account you know, the, uh, uh, the underlying institutional capacities. If you bring Hadley all the financial resources uh, today and you dump them into Lebanon, the, the, we have a lot of capacity constraints. We won't be able to solve the problem. In fact, the IMF has actually failed to take into account or to take note of the unsustainability of Lebanon's dollarized economy. If you look at their most recent Article 4 report, which was published actually on the day the protests in Lebanon erupted, October 17, 2019, the IMF commended the central bank in, in Lebanon for maintaining financial stability. So that's why I keep saying, I mean, I'm a former IMF uh, person. I shouldn't be probably uh, saying this, but we need to be practical. We need to be pragmatic in how we approach this crisis. Yes, there are problems in EDL. There are problems in every single uh, state-owned enterprise in Lebanon. Uh, there is a very inefficient tax system. You are dealing with a country that was literally robbed by a, a few people, uh, Hadley. You're dealing with a country where the central bank is doing now everything that a central bank should not be doing. So the, the, the bottom line is we have to start as soon as possible. The longer we wait, the more painful it's, it's going to be. But you need to start step by step. Those baby steps are extremely important. And before we embark on all these other things, let's just start rehabilitating the financial sector. Without a financial sector, you cannot grow an economy. You cannot really uh, uh, have, have a real economic growth if the banks aren't really uh, capitalized, if they're not doing the, the right job. That has to be, as you guys say in the report, educating the populace about um, not just uh, political reforms, if you will, but but understanding financial reforms as well, because I think we can all agree that Lebanon would not be in the situation that it's in, despite all of the corruption, if people actually understood um, something about um, getting a return on their dollar and what is uh, what is something that one can reasonably expect in a, wall, a world awash with cash. Uh, when you're getting some kind of return that's just not feasible in any other part of the world, but you're getting it from a Lebanese bank, the idea that people were educated enough to understand that there might be a problem would have been helpful. Um, I wanted to just bring uh, Hung Chan in, uh, again on this one, and just in terms of what happens next with it, cultivating um, that kind of competency. Um, it, it seems as if one has a heck of a long way to go in terms of, of getting there. Um, what would be the first thing that, that needs to take place in your view prior to elections? Because as Ambassador Hale did say, I mean, you can't have financial competency without political competency, but what can be done in the short term? Well, two comments. One is uh, to reiterate the point that we talk about bank restructuring uh, as if it is something technical that can happen uh, uh, aloof from uh, the day-to-day -day life of the people. No, the opposite is true. If you restructure the banking system in Lebanon, that will inflict huge losses in savings and wealth of most of the po uh, population in, in the country. Not only the shareholders of the banks or the large depositor of the banks, but everyone. And basically such loss of wealth will depress economic activities for years to come. That will make any recovery even more difficult to achieve, but there's no way to escape that. So be aware that bank restructuring is a very painful and very negative experience for the economy, number one. Number two, 
what I suggest is to form this uh, Lebanese Financial Rehabilitation Fund. And the fund should be uh, organized, managed, and structured by international donor countries under their supervision through a board of uh, supervisors. And the staff should be recruited uh, based on merits and capa uh, capabilities. And uh, as we have said, there's a large diaspora of Lebanese overseas. Many of them are uh, financial experts or banking experts. They can be recruited and staff this fund. And the fund will have the task of really overhauling the home banking system in, in the country, auditing the, the banks, including the central banks, um, and resolve the banks, merge weak banks to reduce the number of banks registered with the central bank, uh, around 142 banks down to let's say 10 or 12 viable banks. And they will have to do all of that and inject money either through equity or loans uh, to serve as a catalyst for other potential investors inside and outside of the country, including in the diaspora, to come in and, and recapitalize the banking system. And that is the very minimum that they can do so that they can begin to get a banking system or banking as, um, entities that can support economic uh, activities. Marissa, before we open it up to questions, I want to follow on to what Hong Chong was saying there, because we're essentially saying that uh, any bank restructuring is going to be incredibly painful, fiscally painful. It's also going to be financially painful. And we've already seen a huge amount of young people. Anyone who can emigrate is getting out of Lebanon if they can at this point, which means that you're going to have a serious um, brain drain and skills gap. Um, what do you think is the greatest challenge there in trying uh, to maintain some kind of, of, of livable um, country, if you will, while at the same time, implementing the reforms that Lebanon has to implement in order to continue as a viable state. Um, Hadley, you, you mentioned a very important concern uh, regarding um, uh, the brain drain that Lebanon is suffering. It came to other, other countries in the region, but more so in Lebanon. Um, I think, again, going back to the term that uh, Rand used earlier, uh, let's look at the low hanging fruit, and particularly when it comes to young people. As you mentioned, we've consulted um, uh, during our workshops with different members of the Lebanese private sector, civil society, et cetera, to uh, enrich our report with, with their ideas. And it was striking to me that there were some business leaders who said, well, we do have jobs, but we're unable to find um, uh, skilled labor for these jobs. And that's where the importance of skilling, upskilling, or reskilling comes into place. These three terms are the, the sort of the, the, the hot topic of the future of work um, regionally and globally. And when it comes to Lebanon, there are tremendous opportunities there where the development um, agencies that already work there can strengthen some of these programs further, particularly in uh, the tech sector. Mohsen mentioned uh, sort of a realignment of the sectors, um, reassessing what these sectors um, uh, that, that Lebanon needs in the future we'll probably have to begin with looking at how technology is part of it. Uh, if we've learned anything during this pandemic is that technology is intrinsically work, uh, linked to the workplace. And so investing in, um, in skilling, particularly digital skills, uh, investing in skills um, that the market needs, and that requires, of course, on, ongoing dialogue between the private sector, um, civil society, and, as well as higher education. And we go back again to sort of how to bring people back to trust, which, which you, you, know, you asked the question earlier uh, to Rand regarding the diaspora. And I think the key word here is engaging in dialogue and, and consultation. Uh, and that's one way you can bring people back, um, back in. Um, Lebanon uh, has historically enjoyed a very vibrant uh, private sector. Yes, the vast majority are micro, small and medium enterprises, but they do have the experience, they do have the local knowledge, and they do have the local connections. They also have relational connections to the diaspora, not transactional ones. And this is how you bring uh, uh, people back in. This is how you engage the diaspora to invest not only in funding or in capital, but also through knowledge transfers um, and expertise. We've seen how the Lebanese diaspora was so successful in, in coming together and pouring um, funds back, uh, back into Lebanon to help their families and friends after the Beirut port explosion. This is an important experience that we should learn from and capitalize on the networks that have already been um, that formed um, in this regard. So, so that's where I think the low hanging fruit is. It's to already work on existing programs, strengthen them, bring in more, more funding. And in the report, one of uh, the, the recommendations or suggestions that we bring forward um, is basically um, a Lebanon incubator investment fund. 
that again could be um, funded by donor countries, including the US um, and, and uh, France and Germany, other EU countries as well, uh, but also regional, uh, regional um, uh, partners and allies of, of the Lebanese people. Uh, and of course, the diaspora, once again, they are key to unlocking the potential um, of people in Lebanon, and particularly with regards to youth, women, and other marginalized groups. I love that point about the incubator investment fund. It's something that uh, we've spoken so often to on and off the record with folks um, in the Lebanese diaspora, as you mentioned, who have lost trust, obviously, in the state and the state apparatus, but are very, very willing to help um, when approached the right way and feeling as if they actually have a voice and a say in how their money and expertise is put to work. But I want to get to our questions now. Um, I want to go first to our expert workshop participants. Faraz Maksad has a question. If you could just unmute Faraz, take it away. Hadley, uh, good to be with you this morning. Good to be with uh, many friends and colleagues, particularly those at the Wilson Center. Um, I think there's a general consensus from the speakers this morning that all things have to begin with the formation of a capable government that can uh, engage with the IMF and other international donors. Of course, the crux of the matter here is how do you get to unlocking the politics of a place like Lebanon that is not just a country whose people are striving for independence and sovereignty, but the fact that Lebanon also happens to be an arena, an arena for regional and international competition. So my question here is primarily directed to Ambassador Hale, but also uh, anybody from the panel that would like to chime in. Uh, we know that Lebanon, um, it, it needed rebooting after the, the war of 15 years that ended in 1990, and that came in the form of a regional and international understanding named the Taif Accords. Uh, it needed another reboot in, in 2008 with the Doha Accords. Are we in a place today where Lebanon needs that kind of regional and international involvement? Uh, obviously, a lot of us, Marissa mentioned the diaspora, a lot of us in the diaspora are pinning our hopes first and foremost on the Lebanese people, uh, civil society, those who are taking to the street on a daily basis, that continues to be so. But the dose of realism also stipulates that we need to look at the regional environment in which Lebanon exists today. So my question really is, and I agree with Ambassador Hale that um, the talks today in Vienna are squarely focused on, on the nuclear, but the Biden administration has made it clear that they hope to engage to have follow-on talks with the Iranians about other issues, including ballistic missiles and the regional situation. Does Lebanon today need that kind of regional understanding, whether we like it or hate it, that would have to include the Iranians, the way that the Taif Accords uh, require the participation of the Assad regime. And uh, if that is the case, uh, how up on the priority list is Lebanon for the Biden administration? Thank you. Ambassador, um, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I agree that the regional dimension is so influential on developments in Lebanon, partly because the Lebanese factions themselves draw or think they draw strength from their alliances with different actors in the region or even the United States. Uh, in my comments at the beginning, I tried to dispel any conception that there would be uh, some grand deal uh, politically that will be a, a foundation for the necessary stability for Lebanon and economic reforms. I don't see it in the cards, I could be wrong, um, but I don't, I don't see any parties willing to step in to that degree uh, to really sort things out. Uh, so that's why I said, uh, don't wait. Uh, the Lebanese should not expect external uh, salvation on, at the political level. I do not believe that uh, U.S.-Iranian relations will create an environment in which the Iranians will feel that they can somehow ease up uh, in their pressure and uh, using Hezbollah as a pressure point uh, in the region and on Israel. Now, that's not going to change. And in, until that changes, uh, we're not going to be doing any uh, favors for the Iranians either, uh, to the contrary. So I, I would not put my uh, hopes in that direction. Uh, I would work now on what is needed to form a government that's good enough uh, and has the capacity to undertake these reforms. And then you'll have the international financial support. Uh, and I agree with the different comments about the limitations to that, but that's a necessary ingredient to, to getting started. Over to you. <clears throat> Just to follow on to that quickly, Ambassador Hale, um, when we talk about the potential for a dual track there to the JCPO con JCPOA conversations happening in Vienna, to your knowledge um, and your work, that is not happening in tandem. Uh, no, no. I, uh, 
pretty pretty certain that's the case. There there is a recognition that the regional issues are going to have to be addressed, um, and uh, but I don't believe that's been uh, raised directly uh, with the Iranians. Uh, we are going to have to uh, see uh, a strategy though that, that supports our friends and allies uh, against Iranian uh, uh, pressure. Back to you. I want to bring in our next uh, question. Uh, this one is also from our expert workshop of participants, Dr. Joseph Jabili. Yes. Hello. This is a this is a question for uh, also Ambassador Hale. Hi, hi, David. So while it's understandable that the uh, you know the U.S., France, and other friends of Lebanon are still pressuring the the current uh, decision makers in the country to do the the proper uh, reforms. Um, and to implement what's been demanded by the people and the international community. But, you know, how can you expect from those who ruined the country, the, with the so-called now mafia militia clique, to, to fix those problems, the problem they created, uh, at the same time when they lost the confidence of the people, uh, the diaspora, and, and, and even quite honestly, many also uh, official abroad. And shouldn't we be more focused on um, instigating the change you know, focusing on elections uh, on time, but maybe as soon as possible, engaging, empowering uh, those who want to change, whether established opposition party or or uh, or new uh, groups. That's the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Great to hear from you. Um, yes, there's much tr truth in what you say. Uh, it's not in my power or I believe any one single person or gov government's power to bring about the kind of sweeping uh, political change that you're describing. I think we have to uh, understand that there's ingredients that we have to work with, whether we like it or not. Um, as some speakers said, uh, the reforms are needed now, economic reforms are needed now. So the sooner we can get a government reform that can at least begin to address these things, even if it's imperfect, uh, I think will be a better outcome than, than the deterioration that we're experiencing now. Um, I would say that uh, while I, I share your negative assessment of many of the factional leaders, there are others who are prepared and understand the urgency of the problem and uh, the nature of the problem. So we need to support them as well. Um, I would, uh, on the topic of elections, uh, we certainly are very concerned uh, about them. This is a, a, a focus in Lebanon uh, during my conversations there. In fact, it, in partly it's an impediment to getting the, the uh, you know, moving on some of the key decisions that need to be made as people sort of maneuver over that. The United States positions uh, been firm and will be firm. Those elections need to occur uh, on time and be free and fair. And we'll see if the people are allowed to express their will, uh, what changes that will bring. Ambassador Hale, you're not speaking for the U.S. government anymore. Can you give us a hint on some of the people that you think are part <laughs> of the government or should be part of the government? That no, I mean, I, I, uh, I know from my time in Lebanon that anything someone like me says about personalities or predictions will be uh, a problem. Uh, so no, I don't, I don't want to go in that direction. <clears throat> our next <laughs> our next question uh, from the workshop participants, Dilip Brata. He wants thank, to unmute. Thank you. Um, uh, there are three, uh, I'm not able to start my video, but anyways, uh, there are three um, channels uh, for mobilizing diaspora resources for Lebanon. Uh, one, you have talked about skills. There are two others, remittances and diaspora investments. On remittances, uh, very easy to pinpoint that, you know, sending money from Australia to Lebanon costs about 12% in fees. Uh, and sending money from UK to Lebanon also on average costs more than 10% according to remittance prices worldwide database of the World Bank. That's a low hanging fruit. Uh, remittances were about 33% of uh, GDP in Lebanon. So that's that's an obvious point. And um, on diaspora investments, mobilizing diaspora investments, a potent tool uh, to be explored, uh, that could be explored is diaspora bonds, where you sell the government or a reputed uh, private uh, company in Lebanon issues a retail diaspora bond in denominations of $1,000 or $2,000 and uh, markets it uh, abroad properly registered in the proper uh, SEC, you know, Securities and Exchange Commission. That I, I, I wanted to leave you uh, with that as a financing tool that could actually mobilize billions of dollars per year 
potentially for Lebanon for all kinds of projects and programs. Thank you. Hadley, mind if I jump in quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dilip, thanks for your comments. We do actually uh, uh, very briefly discussed, uh, uh, discussed diaspora bonds in the report um, as a tool to also engage um, the, the diaspora, but you are the expert on this, so thank you for your um, comments. Our next question is coming from Samir Saleme. Samir? Yes, thank you, Hadley. So good morning, everyone. Uh, Ambassador uh, Hale said uh, when he was here a few months ago, he, he was surprised how grim the situation is or was. I would say now, 60 days later, those days will look back as being literally giddy. Things have gotten far, far worse in the last 60 days than they were 60 days ago. Uh, and as we, as, as we sit around and talk, Rome is, 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 is burning, or in this case, Lebanon is. Um, and the only one that's going to win out of this thing is the only organization in Lebanon that has the organization and the wherewithal to stand firm, and we know who that is. So all that's going to lead us to a failed state very quickly, and that's not good for our neighbors to the south or to anybody in Lebanon. And if, uh, everybody who can get out of Dodge, so to speak, is getting out. And when we will look back at this a few years from now, I think this immigration that's happening now, this brain drain that's happening, is probably the worst that's going to that's going to have the worst effect on this country. The financial situation is bad, as we know, uh, but fixing Lebanon, speaking as a businessman, is not that complicated. This is a very small country. Uh, we don't need that much money in the scheme of things. So money we can get, financing we can get one way or another. The situation is how can we get, A, the, the, the people against the, the current situation, the people who went down to the street on 17 October 2019, to unite. The issue here right now is nobody knows what is required to get this government that everybody's looking for. And my question, I guess, is to Rand is what can the international community here do to help guide us? We were talking about Riyad Salemia earlier, no relation to me, by the way, just to be clear. Uh, and uh, most people in Lebanon still think he's in place because the U.S. government wants him to be in place because they support him. Uh, nobody understands the situation. Nobody understands what does the international community want so that we can unite behind it? And when we go into the elections, hopefully we have elections next year, we actually have a chance to put in a few people in, in, in parliament because as we are right now, we're gonna fail again because we're not united. So what can the international community do to help us unite and prepare for the elections next year? And what can we do in the meantime as literally the country is disintegrating around us? Thank you. Ambassador Hale, do you want to jump in there? Because it kind of follows on to what I was asking you earlier about the fact that most Lebanese see the U.S. meeting with someone like a Riyadh Salemi as an endorsement of him and his policies. Sure, although I thought the question was directed around, but um, uh, it's not the United States uh, place to comment on the uh, qualifications of different Lebanese uh, officials. Uh, this is from the Lebanese system to work out. All, all I said was that uh, it is a common practice of American diplomats, particularly in a place as complicated as Lebanon, to have contacts with everybody. And Riyadh Salami is in a, a key position uh, and uh, in influencing a resolution of this problem. So I think it would be uh, uh, not particularly effective to uh, neglect that relationship. Uh, but it's up to the Lebanese on, on what they're going to do in terms of uh, these positions and so forth. Um, but maybe Rand wanted to, uh, to talk about it as well. <clears throat> yeah, let me, let me just, how do we get there? Uh, let me just say a few things. I, I want to first echo what Ambassador Hale just said. I mean, there is no tool, there is no event, there is no financial engineering or any change in regional powers that would help Lebanon if the Lebanese do not help themselves. That's number one. I mean, before we talk about the international community, they need to unite and they need to decide on how they want to move forward in the next couple of years. Um, two things I would, I would say about the international community. There is today a, uh, a loan from the World Bank, I think $280 million, which is supposedly going to be uh, dispersed to help the most vulnerable groups in society. I think the World Bank needs to do way more than that. Uh, let's not forget, Hadley, that in 2011, I mean, starting 2011, Lebanon welcomed and integrated more than a 
million refugees from Syria. And I think this is in the words of the World Bank director from a couple of days ago. I mean, I don't think the world has responded back to this generosity uh, in the right way. And there needs to be much more that the World Bank and other institutions uh, uh, that they need to do. Uh, there is an idea, and I know you've been talking about it, Hadley, uh, for, for a couple of days now, which is, um, you know, using uh, sanctions as a, as a pressure point. Um, I personally think there is a big question mark on how effective sanctions could be. Uh, I mean, we have a natural experiment today in Lebanon. Uh, one of the former uh, ministers has been sanctioned, uh, Jobran Basile, uh, and I cannot really see, besides the personal, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the impact on the person himself, I do not really see much impact on the population. How, how would this help the population? I think we need to go beyond just sanctions on these corrupt people. We need to, to, to figure out a more, you know, a more comprehensive Marshall Plan to help the population in a way, because we're talking about at least now 50% of the population are in poverty. Marissa, if you want to pop in on that one as well, because when we talk about sanctions, I believe the ones that um, you're referring to, Rand uh, Gibran Basile especially, uh, was just quoted as saying in one of the Lebanese publications, he was just quoted as saying that he hasn't been approached by the U.S. government and hasn't been told what exactly he's been sanctioned for, and those sanctions haven't begun to bite in any real way, but, you know, that's up for debate. Um, but in terms of creating that trust and creating a situation where there would be a government that would not only be viable, but one that the international community and NGOs and the IMF and the World Bank could actually trust uh, to, to work with. How do we get there? That's the million dollar question, but it, it's hard to answer it fully. But I, th I think it starts with ensuring that any dialogue uh, has to, should include uh, members of civil society of the private sector. Um, and those um, activists who are, who are also protesting, um, demanding, uh, demanding change. Uh, without that consultative process, uh, and that perhaps is one way uh, you mentioned earlier what we talk about in the report in terms of educating the people about the financial and economic reforms uh, that we're uh, prescribing in the report. That's one way to educate the people as well on what that entails and how they will be affected by it. Um, and that's also one way to, um, uh, to ensure that you have new emerging leaders. Uh, in, in, in Lebanon. Um, it's, it's, it takes a lot of engagement. Uh, we've already talked about um, investing through, uh, through uh, skilling, and I want to go back to, to, to the skills because one of the sort of major items on the agenda in, in any skilling discussion um, is the need for what they refer to as soft skills. I like to call them essential skills. And those are have to do with communication, negotiation, how to work together in a team, how to build uh, a team, critical thinking, leadership. Those are important skills um, uh, that are uh, definitely missing and are in need, in demand, uh, not only in Lebanon, but regionally and, and, and globally as well. Um, and this is how you plant the seeds. Yes, it's a, it's a long-term process, but you have to start somewhere. Um, and, and again, the um, donor community, international organizations who are already working in that space, they are not solely working with the Lebanese people, but also working with refugee populations. This is how uh, this is how you um, uh, you, you focus on uh, those sort of medium to long term uh, solutions. There is no um, quick fix to this. I want to take one more question from the expert workshop. It's Rima Freji. Rima. Um, hello, so I come from the agri-food sector and uh, we've been meeting quite regularly as a private sector network. Uh, trying to work on two key issues. One is to lobby, and we need help in that, actually, even in uh, financing the lobbying that we're planning to do, to allocate responsibility back to where responsibility should be. We believe there's been a deliberate uh, attempt at reducing confidence with the private sector. And the other aspect is how can we a bridge between the existing businesses that have the capacity to grow and accelerate the growth of these incubators or any other work that you're doing as NGOs or international organizations without access to financing. So there's a lot of businesses here that are still viable, that can still contribute to the economy and can accelerate this growth. And we would like to see how can we uh, bridge our um, work with the work that you're doing. 
Rand, would you like to take that one? I want to go back to uh, the uh, the point that Marissa and uh, Dr. Dilip Ratha brought up, which is I think fits very nicely in uh, in in this particular uh, field, which is the diaspora bonds. The the idea of a diaspora bond is to involve the uh, the Lebanese abroad in basically projects in Lebanon, and mainly projects that appeal to them. So I know a lot of a lot of the Lebanese uh, in the U.S., in Europe, all over the place. Uh, in the Middle East are very interested in, in helping. They just don't want to go through government institutions. And the government, uh, the, the diaspora bond, or what um, people refer to sometimes as a patriotic bond, is a way to channel the money rather than actually getting it through the banking sector and being it spent on unproductive resources. It's a way to channel the money to these projects that are really important and appealing for, for us outside healthcare, um, agriculture, development. And, uh, you know, without really getting into the, the technicalities of it, it's a win-win scenario. I mean, on one side, it would be structured in a way that would provide the Lebanese abroad with a much higher return on how much you, they would get if they leave their money in a, in a U.S. bank account, for example. At the same way, it would provide the Lebanese in Lebanon, the private sector and institutions in general, with a cheaper way to uh, basically source financing. It would be much more cheaper. It would be structured to, in a way that would make it much more cheaper to raise funds rather than going on the international market. So I think the diaspora bond is an excellent idea. It's been implemented in many different countries in, in, in uh, the region as well. And it was very successful in raising a lot of funds. I think we should take this seriously. And we've been talking about it for quite some time now. Kathleen, can I add a comment here? Yes, yes, please. Yes, I just want to uh, bring to your attention that the revitalized and viable banking system is a very important important source of financing for small and medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises. And that is the case for every other countries, even in the US. So I think that restructuring the banks can serve the purpose of making financing available to more uh, participants in, in Lebanon. I want to take it now to a one, the first question from the actual audience um, beyond our workshop of, of participants. This question concerns the energy sector. It's one of those big ones that we talk about on CNBC on a regular basis. Essentially this question, uh, the electricity sector is at the heart of the economic and fiscal crisis, accountable for about 40% of the public debt. Lebanon has been suffering from a chronic electricity shortage for almost three decades. The question, shouldn't reforming the energy sector be the priority to recover the country? And what should be the key factors in reforming that sector? Rand or Hung, which one would you like to take? A stab at this one first, if you would. Let me let me let me say uh, in less than a minute. It's a, it's a priority, but it's not the immediate priority. Just because you don't want to overwhelm the institutions and the country. It's a country that is flat on its back right now, and there is so many things that are considered priorities. I mean, the uh, the tax system is a priority. The banking sector is a priority. The uh, every state institution, the customs, controlling the border is a priority. Uh, a new monetary policy regime is a priority. But I think, in my view, and I think uh, Hung would agree, and that's his, uh, his expertise, the most urgent thing right now is to get the banking sector and then we can embark onto uh, uh, EDL and other things. Uh, absolutely, there's a, a huge drain on the budget that came from EDL. I think the World Bank estimated it in around like $43 billion. It is an important uh, reform, but I would say let's wait until we first deal with the bleeding. Uh, Hong, do you want to uh, address this as well? Sorry. No, I agree with you completely. Thank you. And then our second audience question uh, concerns the justice system. The justice system in Lebanon is on paper that of a republic, but in practice, selective enforcement um, happens of, across all judicial rulings. Can Lebanon realistically achieve economic stability without a credible and accountable judicial system? On a limb and say the answer to that one's probably no, but take a, a stab at this one in terms of the judicial accountability at this point. Sorry. Okay, say it's this is part of uh, 
Uh, and I think also for the community, we are, uh, we are in need of But we are things like uh, uh, to improve how we actually manage institutions. We, we need this, uh, the judiciary uh, sector and other uh, sector. But definitely, this is something that would need to be in place. Uh, rule of independent important otherwise you cannot really create an environment a good business environment for the private sector to operate efficiently or to start you know uh, uh, believing again in the institutions a little earlier today with the lebanese parliament approving um this one year 556 million ration card this was for half a million families that essentially amount to three dollars um, there are a lot of things to be understood about this in terms of criteria moving forward. Um, but stopgap measures like this one obviously are obvious, just not um, to stem the bleeding. And as the panelists have said um, multiple um, to fix the situation in Lebanon, it's going to hurt and it's going to um, I want to get the final thoughts um, from each of the, the panelists on this one, um, just in terms of what happens next, the short term, and then we'll Ambassador Hale in terms of what could potentially be expected in his view um, from the international community and what has to be done, at least in the short term, to get us there. I just I think the the basically in the stages laid out in the report, uh, I agree with them and I think And see what you I'm not sure that that you can do all that the report is saying uh, um, but um, start I'll just say one other thing with in, in closing in, in uh, to avoid being get, getting carried away diaspora bonds are in principle a good thing but diaspora bonds are very much like euro bonds because basically they are uh, Government of Lebanon, and therefore they're like euro bonds. So I don't see the the market for diaspora, whether it ran like you call them patriotic bonds, etc. Diaspora bonds have been used by countries that are stable, need resources. It's not countries that have been basically over borrowing on the in euro bonds and then come along and and. You call it back. I'll end there. Marissa. Thanks, Hadley. I think um, I, I'd leave everyone with, with this thought uh, summarizing sort of uh, the economic Mohsen described um, about my chapter. Um, so a key element of this economic transformation that we all hope for and hope to see um, in the country's workforce formula. Um, so on the supply side, emphasizing skills, particularly marginalized, um, but also on the demand side, uh, access to finance and facilitating access to markets. And one way we can do that, shop, shop for, uh, for SMEs um, and sort of work through existing frameworks that exist. And I'm going to leave you with one, one example. The FTA with the EU is came up in so this is an opportunity for some of the EU countries to come in and perhaps um, train and, and build sector um, to enable um, uh, small and medium businesses to grow their businesses and access markets um, in Europe. Thank you. Hong? Well, time is of the essence. The longer uh, this crisis lingers on, the worse it will become. And the worst, the suffering of the people in Lebanon, humanitarian crisis, but also for neighboring countries and the international community. If Lebanon becomes a failed state, spewing out refugees and terrorists, uh, destabilizing the whole situation. So I think that I hope this situation will, and this logic will eventually crystallize and, 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 and focus the minds of the people 
so that's a minimal agreement to uh, reform will come for. Rand. Um, my last point is just to remind the international community that Lebanon is extremely fragile. It's, uh, it's extremely uh, instable at the moment, and it requires a very pragmatic, customized and patient approach. Uh, despite all the weaknesses that we talked about today and despite what we brought up in the uh, in the report uh, let's not forget in Lebanon and in the diaspora there is an enormous amount of human capital there is a lot of potential and it's not the end of the road this is of course not Argentina this is not Greek this is not even Venezuela it's a very unprecedented crisis but the Lebanese can do it and I'm sure they will if they come together uh, the first step, let me end it with this very first step, is we need to create a government. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can, we cannot talk to the international community if we don't have a government. And this needs to be a very credible government of reform. Thank you. Ambassador Hill, I just want to get your final thoughts on this one, obviously from the wealth of your experience, and we deeply appreciate your participation in this. And I, I bring it back to this quote, the magnificent experiment in cross communal life that cannot be allowed to fail. It cannot be allowed to fail for the region. It can't be a fail, allowed to fail for Western powers and certainly cannot be allowed to fail uh, by the United States. Ambassador Hale, your thoughts? I, I completely agree. The United States does not want Lebanon to collapse uh, further than it has already. Uh, but no external power uh, can impose a political compromise uh, on the parties inside Lebanon that we can urge and cajole, uh, but th they have to make the decisions necessary. That's what I've said to them on three consecutive visits uh, to Lebanon in the last year and a half. Um, there's no absence of great ideas on what needs to be done in the, in the economy and our reform. We heard many of them today. Uh, I agree about customizing things, uh, but um, what's absent is the necessary political flexibility and will. The Lebanese have to take the first steps. Uh, they have to form a government. Uh, and then the international community will help. The path to recovery will be very long and very painful. But I too have faith in the Lebanese people. You look around the world and you see uh, countless success stories and those successes can occur in Lebanon again with the right kind of leadership. Thank you, Hadley. Thank you, all of you, once again, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for joining us. And hopefully um, this is not the end of this conversation, but actually the beginning of a much bigger conversation. I wanna say thank you all very much again and uh, thank you on the part of CNBC as well.